Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for another Rock Jumper Dream Destination Tour. Nikki Stewart here from Rock Jumper Birding Tours Mauritius, hosting today's webinar with a new co host, Lev Fred from Rock Jumper Birding Hi, Tours Lev. Canada. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Lev, for joining us today. Thank um, you, Nikki, for having me. Yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> My usual co-host, Keith Valentine, is away this week to support his mom following her spinal surgery. We wish you a speedy recovery, Mrs. Valentine, and hope you feel better soon. If you're new to Zoom, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Send us your questions and we will answer as many as we can at the end of today's virtual tour. Today, we are looking at the spectacular birds of the world by Rock Jumper's founder, Adam Riley. Adam has traveled extensively throughout the world, leading tours, and is one of Africa's most experienced birders, having seen over 2,000 species on the continent and over 8,000 worldwide, many of which he has photographed. He is particularly proud of the conservation initiatives he has been able to support through his work and businesses. Adam serves on BirdLife International's advisory board and holds other conservation, conservation related positions. He has been a member of YPO since 2013 and served as the YPO Durban chapter chair from 2018 to 2020. Adam and Felicity have three beautiful children, William seven, Alex five, and Victoria three, and live in Hilton, South Africa. Thank you, Adam, for taking us around the world today and showcasing your favorite bird photos and amazing adventures. Thank you very much, Nikki, and uh, Lev also for co-hosting. And uh, thank you everyone for joining me this evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are. And if you are in the US, uh, I wish you happy Thanksgiving for tomorrow. So yeah, let me kick off. Um, in common with, with many kids, I was an avid collector. Um, stamps, uh, stickers, coins, stones, anything I could get my hands on to. I also love nature and exploring wild areas, but these two passions of mine seem pretty incongruous. Until one Christmas when I was 13, I was given a bird book um, as a gift. And immediately, uh, I just saw how my uh, sort of collecting passion and my passion for wilderness just joined each other. The first thing I did is, is made a list of the birds that occurred around my hometown, Peter Marisburg. And then I went out and tried to tick them all off and basically complete the collection. And that, as Nikki said, spread and spread and spread till now I've seen over 8,000 uh, birds around the world. Um, and yeah, life really wasn't the same for me after that. Um, and, you know, back in the 80s, uh, when I started bird watching, it was, however, considered a little bit strange for, for a, a young teenager to, to just be interested in birds. It, it wasn't as mainstream. Um, as, as it is now, and I was often accosted with the refrain, you know, do, do you also look at the two-legged kind, which I thought very strange since, um, you know, even feather birds have two legs. But anyway, I kept, I kept at it. And uh, as I got into high school, I had to choose my subjects that uh, I needed to, to study. And I never thought that bird watching could ever be a, a potential career. But I, I was bird watching every weekend, and and uh, I, inche instead I chose to be a chartered accountant or, or CPA, as you call it in the US. Um, but birding was my primary pastime. This was uh, my first birding trip to Madagascar, my first international birding trip to Madagascar, with a, a bunch of good friends um, back in '96, um, and. As, as I finished my studies and then started doing my articles uh, with KPMG in my hometown in Marsburg, I really wasn't looking forward to this career behind a desk. 
And I remember one day my friend Andrew McKechnie, who's now a professor of ornithology, saw that I was feeling really stressed and invited me to go up Sani Pass, um, which is a, a mountain road out of South Africa into the mountain kingdom of, of Lesotho. And uh, so off we went, uh, Friday night, we, we sort of camped just at the bottom of the road. And um, the next day we, we hiked up, it was, you know, we were still students, we, we didn't have a four by four, which is the only way to get up this road. And I kind of had an epiphany on, on the mountain. I saw my first rock jumper, which was a momentous occasion for me. This is a bird that only occurs at, at very high elevation. In South Africa, it, it's uh, one of our endemic shared with Lesotho and is actually a, a bird uh, family, the rock jumpers that only occur in South Africa. And this eventually over the next couple of years led to the creation of rock jumper birding tours. So in 1998, during my final year of articles, um, my good friend Jonathan Rousseau who were recently qualified as a doctor and I were, were chatting about what we were going to do. And we, and we decided let's put our careers on hold for a couple of years and start this bird to a company, which we ended up calling Rock Jumper and have a bit of fun and see the world and um, then go back to our careers after a few more years. So even back then it, it was a, a, a temporary idea. Um, and now it's uh, 22 years later and this is pretty much still what I do for my living basically going out and showing people birds and uh, just having a great time traveling the world. Well, that was until COVID came along and I look forward very much to, to birding with many of you once, uh, once this craziness is over. And, uh, you know, over the years, I, I've just stuck at it and, and just had a great time and so many adventures. And sometimes I kind of pinch myself and, and when, wonder when I'm going to stop playing and, and actually get a real job. But over the years, um, Rock Jumper has grown and grown and grown to be, you know, the most successful and, and largest bird to a company in the world. And we have a large cohort of fantastic guides um, operating literally hundreds of birding tours to over 100 countries every year. And it's just, uh, you know, just, it's, it's been a fantastic, fantastic experience. Um, yeah, I used to travel in the early days of Rock Jumper about 10 months of the year. Um, but as the business grew, I, I kind of guided less and less. And as, as uh, Nikki mentions, I've got a small family. And, and once uh, my first child was born, I cut back further on guiding. And um, I now also have a fantastic management team of, of Nikki and Mauritius and George Armistead in Philadelphia, uh, Keith in, in, South Af in Cape Town and uh, Clayton Byrne in, in uh, Hilton is where, where I'm also based, who, who do most of the uh, operations now of, of Rock Jumper. So back to the Drakensberg Mountains and, and uh, the wonderful birds, spectacular birds of the world. So another one of the uh, special birds of the Drakensberg Mountains is the Lamagaya, also known as the bearded vulture. And um, this is one of uh, the only known vertebrate whose diet consists almost exclusively of bones. And uh, when traveling up to Sani Pass, Lesotho in, in particular, where I most often see this bird, I've actually seen them um, picking up bones and dropping them on a particular rock that's called an ossuary. So, so they, they, they have these rocks which they use to smash the bones into sizes that they can actually swallow. You also see this orange coloration on, on this bird. And this is actually a, a cosmetic coloration. They rub against rocks um, and sand that, that uh, gives them that color. Um, one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken is, is this one. And uh, this is an adult and a juvenile Lamagaya having an amazing tussle in the air. I was really, really thrilled to, to capture this uh, action. Another bird that you get in high elevations, especially up in the mountains, the Drakensberg Mountains, is the southern bald ibis. This bird is endemic to South Africa, Lesotho and Swaziland with, with quite a declining range. It used to occur all the way from Cape Town northwards. Now it's just centered around the Drakensberg Mountains with a few outlying colonies. And there's about eight to 10 birds remaining in, in about a hundred colonies. 
obviously the name comes from that uh, bald head and has this beautiful glossy plumage. There are actually two species of, of bald ibis and the other one is called the northern bald ibis or waldrap. Um, this is a photograph I took of, of this bird in Morocco and it has quite an interesting history. In the middle ages it bred widely across Europe on cliffs and castle ramparts. The first conservation decree in, in 1504 was actually to protect this bird uh, in, in Austria. But it slowly became extinct and by, by the 1700s it completely disappeared out of Europe. And then it, it became extinct in Europe and across most of North Africa. Until in the 19, 1990 there were only two colonies left in coastal Morocco of approximately 56 pairs. However, intensive conservation efforts um, were put into these uh, last remaining colonies and now there's over 147 pairs of these two colonies and other colonies have been established elsewhere um, in its original range. Um, so this is one of the top birds uh, that we look for on our Morocco tour. Another group of birds that's uh, really one of my favorites are the cranes. Um, this is the blue crane, which if I had to list one favorite bird in the whole world, it will be this species. It just has a wonderful call, occurs on, on grasslands of, of South Africa, with the range just extending into, into parts of Namibia. And it's actually South Africa's national bird. It's on our five cent coin. And is one of the most range restricted of the, of the 15 crane species. Over the last uh, couple of decades, it's had a 90% population decline. But fortunately, uh, it's colonized the wheat fields of the Western Cape over the last few years, and the numbers are, are recovering really well, um, although in, in much of its range, as, as with many other grassland species, it's under serious trouble. And you can see what looks like uh, tail feathers, a long tail on this bird. This is actually the, uh, the uh, retrices or wing feathers, um, which it uses in this beautiful dances, um, these fantastic wing plumes. Another one of the world's most spectacular birds is the uh, gray crown crane. There's two species of crown cranes in Africa, black and gray. The gray one occurs fr from South Africa up into East Africa and is actually the national bird and emblem of Uganda. This is a photo I took in the Ngorongoro crater on my most recent trip there with the American Birding Association. And uh, we're thrilled to find this adult with uh, three cute little chicks. This is one of my favorite birds, gray crown crane. And you can see the, the red gula sack and these incredible phyllo plumes, which are hair-like feathers um, forming this, this incredible um, crown. Um, staring sort of blue eye and white face it, it, and sort of plush crown. It, it really is a, an Here we have one of the largest cranes. This is the Brolga, um, which is an Australian species. Um, here it's doing um, its uh, display. A lot of the cranes have wonderful displays. Um, this one occurs through North and Eastern Australia, New Guinea. And like most cranes, it's monogamous and bonds for life. Um, the Demazel crane is uh, the smallest crane. Um, apparently it was named by uh, Mary Antoinette, um, Queen of, of France, for its delicate maiden-like appearance. They mostly breed on the, um, uh, in Mongolia and migrate over the, uh, over the Himalayas, one of the harshest migrations of, of all birds down into the uh, Indian subcontinent. And uh, the best place to see these uh, Demazal cranes is in a small village called Kichan in Northwest India. And uh, this next uh, slide is actually a short video, which hopefully is gonna play. And uh, this is how you get to see them. So this, this is uh, myself with my young son, William, sitting on my lap in Kichan. And there's actually a, a plot in the, in the middle of this uh, small town where 10 to 15,000 of these cranes um, actually come during the winter months in the area. 
and um, the, the, the town actually put out about uh, three tons of grain a day to feed these birds. I've been feeding them since the 1970s and it's been sponsored by the Jane community of the area. But it really is quite a remarkable experience. And here's a, a, a few more photos um, right from, from the top of that building in Kichan of these uh, Demazel cranes. It really is uh, a lot of fun. Another group of birds uh, that are amongst my favorites are the raptors. This is one of uh, Africa's uh, most exciting raptors. This is the crowned eagle. It's not our largest raptor and it's not as big as the harpy and, and crowned eagle, sorry, crested eagle of um, the Americas, but it's Africa's most powerful eagle. And they uh, prey largely on, on monkeys and up to the size of, of bushbuck, so up to 30 kilograms of 66 pound prey has been known to be taken. And they have extremely powerful talons used for crushing skulls. About 90% of, of their diet is mammalian. Um, and what's been quite interesting over the last 10 years is these crowned eagles have actually adapted to, to living in suburbia. And um, here they often do take cats and dogs, but also um, are, are, are well known for taking hardy dars, which is another bird, large ibis, that has uh, really bred up well in, in suburbia and South Africa. So it's just wonderful seeing these incredibly large and beautiful raptors in, in around the towns where we live. Africa's largest uh, eagle, also known as the leopard of the air, is the martial eagle. Um, has a wingspan of up to 2.27 meters, 7.4 feet, and uh, extremely keen eyesight, um, apparently 3.6 times that of, of human acuity. Their eyes are actually nearly as large as a human's eye, and they can spot prey from great distances as far as five to six kilometers or three or four miles away. And they can also uh, prey, well, they also do prey on fairly large mammals as well as, as birds and reptiles. I've seen them um, have killed uh, Cory Bustard, which is uh, one of the largest, uh, or is the largest flying bird of the world. And uh, one of the rangers in Tanzania I was with uh, quite recently was telling me he actually saw one flying off with a baby cheetah. Quite amazing. This is the black-breasted snake eagle. And uh, this, this is one of the raptors that uh, is, is really good at hovering. So they spend a lot of time up in the air Again, with amazing eyesight, picking out snakes. Their diet is almost exclusively snakes. Um, so pick them out from great distance and, and just you know, hover out there. Just an amazing um, feature to watch. Another one of my favorite photos is this one. And this uh, is three species of raptors, as you can see here. On the top left is an Egyptian vulture. Below that is a steppe eagle. And on the top right is a juvenile black kite. And these are fighting over a scrap of meat. And the place where I took this is uh, not the most savory place I've, I've ever birded. This is the Bikaneer Camel Dump in Northwest India in Rajasthan. And based nearby, there's a, a camel research station and all the camels that die, they, they dump here. And there's, it, it just attracts huge numbers of, of vultures and raptors and these uh, feral dogs that behave like hyenas. Um, the smell's not all that great. There's also uh, a population of, of people actually living there who, who skin the, the camels and, and live off selling um, these camel skins. But it does attract a wonderful uh, variety of, of raptors and, and other birds. Uh, here's another photo from the same site. This is a steppe eagle. Um, steppe eagles are migrants. They breed on the steppes of Russia, the treeless steppes, and, and they actually nest on the ground as a, as a result of, of where they breed. And uh, in summer, in, in the northern summer when they breed, they specialize predators of ground squirrels. But in winter, they migrate into India and southern Asia and all the way down to South Africa. And in, in, in Africa in particular, they spend most of their, their winter feeding on, on insect swarms, uh, like emerging termites, uh, as well as quelia colonies. Quelias are, are tiny finches that can breed in, in colonies of sometimes hundreds, hundreds of thousands and millions. And uh, 
these step eagles are attracted to these colonies and, and uh, feast on, on this cornucopia of food. India um, is actually a fantastic place for, for photography and also for family holidays. I've, I've done two trips uh, around India with, with my small children and uh, we've had absolutely amazing times. And the other great thing about India is they have this culture of not disturbing wildlife. <clears throat> so you can really get close to, to birds and animals and, and uh, get uh, great photographs of them. So the next few photos are, are some of my favorite uh, um, pictures from India. This is the crested serpent eagle, which is a sedentary species. They spend about 98% of their time perched. So essentially sit and wait hunters. On the other end of the spectrum, this is the red avidavit or strawberry finch, which I photographed also in Rajasthan. And as you can see here, it's feeding on, on grass seeds, beautiful little birds. Another photo that I was particularly proud to get is this white-throated kingfisher. It's actually quite a common kingfisher across much of India, but I just managed to get it as it was stretching its wings in the early morning, and I, I, I love this photo. Um, another bird pretty common in India, um, this is the long-tailed shrike. And this is at the uh, entrance to, to one of the tiger reserves, um, Ranthambore in India. And uh, the local people put out seeds and you get all these uh, plum-headed parakeets coming down. Um, just just a, a, a wonderful opportunity to view, view these incredibly colorful, noisy and, and active birds. Here we have the brown fish owl, which is uh, in, in much of India actually still quite common. And they feed on, on fish as their name suggests, as well as frogs and crabs and are found uh, along streams. And they're often out, this was early in the morning, I'll still sit out and catch the first few rays of sun. And here we have a pair of great egrets in, in the sunset. Um, I'm not usually one for, for kind of artistic photos, um, but this is a, a lovely reflection of, of these great egrets. Great egrets are one of the world's most widespread species occurring through virtually the whole world except Antarctica. One of our biggest adventures uh, with my family in India was to see one of the world's rarest and most endangered birds. For this, we had to hire, <clears throat> um, we had a specialist come along with us, as well as a local guide, and then we hired Rajabad the camel. So uh, my, my wife and mother-in-law and our two little boys were loaded up on the camel, and the rest of us walked through Desert National Park until we eventually came across a great Indian bustard. This is a critically endangered species. Um, they estimate less than 150 alive. Um, and it's mostly been affected by agricultural expansion, even in the national parks and power line infrastructure. And sadly, this is one of the species um, that doesn't have much hope of surviving into the future. Um, but we can, we can all hope that conservation measures um, will, will reverse the situation but the population pressure on the species, which requires large areas, is, is very intense. Um, a lot of people don't think of Europe as uh, a great birding destination. Um, this is uh, summer in, in Finland. This is June, believe it or not, on a tour we did a few years ago. Um, I was taken aback about how cold it was that time of year, but I guess we did have an unusually cold uh, snap. But Europe, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, actually does have some remarkable birding. Um, here's a few of my favorite photos. This is uh, one of the coolest birds in Europe. This is uh, the Bohemian waxwing. It also does occur in, in the northern parts of, of North America. And the name waxwing comes from that little red spot on the wing, which looks like a uh, red sealing wax. And uh, the name Bohemian refers to the Romani or gypsies. And uh, it was given to this bird because of their eruptive behavior. So there can be in areas, you know, huge numbers of them, and then they don't appear again for, for years and years. And then suddenly huge flocks of them appear. Um, in winter, they feed uh, mostly on berries and are actually able to double their body weight in a day. And then in summer, their diet changes to mosquitoes. So they're actually really helpful in these northern areas where mosquitoes can be really fierce. Another very cool European bird is the bearded reedling. 
<clears throat> so at the moment, there's 10,787 species of birds, if you follow the IOC checklist. And these 10,787 species are divided into 252 families. A lot of birders nowadays realize they're not going to see all 10,000 birds in the world. So instead, they go and try to see one representative or at least one representative of each family. And once you've seen these 252, um, you've, you've, you've seen the, the great biodiversity or diversity of, of bird life. Um, personally, I've, I've seen 251 of the 252, so I had one left to see which was on the cards for this year, but is going to have to wait for another year. So most of the, these 252 bird families have many species within the family, but there are a few very special families that are monotypic meaning there's only one species in that family. So these are very genetically unique birds. And this bearded reedling is such an example. So it has no living bird species closely related to it. Um, they live in marshes of uh, Central and, and Northern Europe. And they also have a really interesting uh, biology where they also change diet um, between summer and winter. So they live in reed beds and in summer they feed on aphids and then their diet switches to, to uh, seeds uh, in winter, which requires the entire digestive uh, system to change. Ah, the phantom of the north. Uh, this bird took me a very long time and I was absolutely thrilled to finally find it. This is the, by length, but not by weight, the world's largest owl. This is the great gray owl. It has the largest facial disc of any raptor. And this is used for focusing on sound. It can hear a mouse two feet below the snow in winter, and then plunge down and grab it. Um, this is definitely one of the, the world's great, great birds, the um, great gray owl. Uh, divers or, or loons are, are another fantastic family of our Northern Hemisphere birds. Um, this is the black-throated diver or, or Arctic loon. Um, during summer, they breed on, on freshwater lakes. You can hear their beautiful whistled song which you often hear in the back of, of movies. And uh, then in winter, they actually uh, go out to sea. So another bird that's also not a duck, but uh, is a water bird, a uh, duck-like bird, is, um, the, are the grebes. And this is the Slavonian or horn grebe, as it's called in, in the US. And um, this, I photographed this one on a small pond in Finland where it was uh, defending its territory. Um, they have very, very uh, strong pair bonds and are um, wonderful birds to watch their behavior as they dive underwater and pop up and call, as you can see, this bird was in the middle of doing. Another bird that took me um, a long time to find until I finally uh, got it on this uh, snowy summer day in Finland was the hazel grass. It occurs in, in spruce woodlands of, of Europe and Asia. And you can see this beautiful, finely patterned fleck plumage. And it's an extremely secretive bird. Um, here we're very lucky. One of them flew up into a tree and, and kind of froze there for, for me to be able to get these photos. Another bird that we see a lot in South Africa, it migrates down to South Africa, is the ruff. But I was particularly looking forward to seeing um, this species when I went to, to Northern Europe. And... Uh, what makes this bird fascinating uh, in, in the summer is that the males, or most of the males, grow this beautiful big, uh, or, or these ornamental feathers, hence giving the, the, the name uh, ruff. The scientific name is Adris pugnax, pugnax uh, from the same source as the word pugnacious or aggressive, and it's because of the extremely aggressive territorial behavior. So they breed in the European tundra, um, and basically they, they have something called a lek where males will stake out small territories and then display and hoping to attract females with which they, they mate and pass on their genes. And there's been some fascinating studies about how this actually works in ruffs. So what's been discovered is that there's actually three forms of males. 84% of them are territorial males with a dark ruff that you can see at the back of this uh, photograph. 15% are smaller satellite males with a white ruff on the right. And then 
1% are small female mimic males, which look like this, this individual at the front here. I'm not sure whether this is a, a female or a, a female mimic male. So the, the dominant males, the dark ones, have their small little territories within the lek, and these they defend and perform these amazing displays and dances and, and aggressively fight. The satellite males don't hold territories and they move around the, 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 the lek and are actually tolerated by the dominant males because apparently leks which have both kinds of males attract more females. The mimic males are more recently discovered and they are much smaller and what they do is they sneak around uh, the leks and as a female sort of crouches down to copulate with a, a dominant male, he'll jump in there and, and do the job and, and dart off. Um, however, he also risks being, uh, you know, copulated with himself. But what's also really fascinating is it's been noted that they actually sometimes copulate um, with the, um, the dominant males. And the reason I believe this is this happens and, and is allowed to happen is that lex where there's more copulation happening um, also attract more females. So it's really all seems to be all in a day's work um, when you're passing on your genes, but uh, really fascinating behavior. Um, another one of the birds uh, of, of Northern Europe that I really wanted to see was the Western Capercaillie. This is the largest known grouse in the world, um, weighs up to seven kilograms or 15 pounds, and is one of the most sexually dimorphic of any birds in, with regard to size, uh, the males are, are double the weight of, of females. And they live in coniferous forests. And in winter, they actually feed on, on pine needles and swallow small stones to aid their digestion. Um, and you get what are called deviant males uh, in, in Capicales, um, very small percentage of them, but with five times higher testosterone than the average males. And these birds are super, super aggressive. And in Finland, we actually came across one of these uh, deviant males. And this is just, uh, uh, the next is a, is a short video of the behavior of this incredibly ag aggressive bird. Here we go. Yeah, really, really, um, that bird definitely wanted us off his territory, which we did soon thereafter. So Antarctica is, um, you know, the last remaining great wilderness in the world and, and a trip to the seventh continent is certainly a, an experience of a lifetime. Um, I've been fortunate to have gone twice. Um, extreme weather. Uh, at times. Uh, this, is, this photo is probably the most painful photograph I ever took. We're just off uh, South Georgia Island and there was this incredible catabatic wind coming off the mountains of South Georgia. It was about 300 kilometers an hour. Well, they get up to about 300 kilometers an hour, 180 miles an hour. And I remember peeking out from the top of the ship and quickly clicking this photograph. And the wind actually had these razor sharp ice crystals in it that just really sting your eyes. But fortunately, um, most of the weather on, on my trip to South Georgia was, was fantastic. This is uh, St. Andrew's Bay, one of the um, most amazing spectacles in the world that I've ever seen. There's about 150,000 king penguins here. And you can climb off and just walk in, in around this colony, just watching the behavior and seeing the birds coming in and feeding the young. Um, also, you know, some extreme weather at times, um, but that, that's all part of uh, being in these uh, southern parts of the world. Quite a few other species of penguins, of course, uh, down in the Antarctic. Uh, this is the chinstrap penguin, extremely noisy bird. And here we have a, a pair of very grumpy looking uh, rock hopper penguins. And uh, the albatrosses are another wonderful, wonderful group of birds. 
This, this is the wandering albatross, has the largest wingspan of any bird in the world, about three and a half meters or 11 and a half feet. And they can circumnavigate the Southern Oceans about three times in a year, covering about 125,000 kilometers or 75,000 miles in a year. Just magnificent birds to see. Almost the same size as the Southern Royal Albatross. And on a trip to the uh, New Zealand Subantarctic Islands, we we're very fortunate to, to go to Campbell Island where um, they have boardwalks through the tussock grassland where you can get right up to uh, or close to nests of the Southern Royal Albatross. Um, just a, a wonderful experience seeing their, their dances and, and mating rituals and just spending time with these massive, massive birds at, at fairly close quarters. Here we also had the, the stunning light mantled albatross and they were also nesting in these New Zealand subantarctic islands. Here we have uh, white capped albatross of Auckland Island, also in the New Zealand subantarctic, and uh, they were nesting on a cliff. I took this photo from below where they were just sitting in the wind, absolutely stationary um, as, as they're hovering. And here we have the uh, Indian yellow nosed albatross, uh, beautiful reflections on the water. Albatrosses really are special birds. However, my favorite habitat is probably the rainforests. This is a view um, from the Ecuadorian Amazon. And this is from a canopy tower at uh, Napo Wildlife Center. This is a, a 40 meter, 130 foot tall tower built uh, close to a, an emergent tree um, in the Amazon. And the next series of photos are, are all images taken just from a few hours spent on in one morning um, at this canopy tower. So at the lower levels, we had this beautiful golden collared toucanet. And then moving a little bit higher, um, lemon breasted barbet. And further up, we just had an amazing tanager flock come by. So if you're not familiar with tanagers, these are small, um, mostly fruit eating birds that um, there's a huge species diversity of them. And, and in South America, you can sometimes get 10 or 15 species all together moving as a flock. And we're very fortunate to have one of these incredible flocks whilst we're up in the canopy tower here. And the birds are in the canopy are not used to people, obviously. So they approach really, really closely. Um, they don't seem afraid of you. So this is the mask tanager. And then we had opal rump tanager coming in close, um, turquoise tanager, um, the marvelous paradise tanager. And then very closely related to tanagers are dacnus. Um, this is the yellow bellied dacnus. This is a pair. Obviously, the female is the duller one. And the blue dacnus. And whilst all this activity was going on, suddenly a double toothed kite flew in and it was carrying nesting material. And we ha hadn't noticed just a few meters away from us, there was actually a, a, a nest under construction of the double toothed kite. Um, this photo, I, I couldn't even fit all the birds in because they were actually too close. The Andes is um, certainly the most ex uh, um, biodiverse uh, region of the world um, for birds. Um, you know, for instance, uh, Colombia has nearly 2,000 bird species um, and a not particularly large country. And uh, the Andes themselves are, are just offer the most incredible birding. So one of our tour leaders, uh, Dushan Brinkhazen, was part of a team um, that saw 443 species in one day in a single 24 hour period um, along the Andes of, uh, in Ecuador. This is a scene um, from Colombia with forests stretching as far as I can see. Um, one of the most pleasing things to the soul is just to see unbroken forests like this and the Andes offers quite a lot of opportunity for, for this kind of scenery. And he's also obviously goes to, to very high elevations. Um, this is the Summa Paz Paramo, about 4,000 meters or 13,000 feet above sea level in Colombia, not, not far out of Bogota. And these strange plants in, in the background, uh, this is Jeff Gordon from the American Birding Association in the image, um, are Espeletias, which are actually in the sunflower family. I'll mention them again shortly. 
And um, yeah, not, not just uh, natural scenery, but there, there's also some amazing sites in the Andes. Uh, this is one of the greatest of them all, Manchu Pichu, which was a 15th century uh, Inca citadel situated about 700 feet above sea level, 2,340 meters. And it was abandoned uh, during the, the Spanish in, um, occupation of, of Peru in 1572 and only rediscovered by explorer Hiram Bingham in 1911. And uh, it is truly one of the most amazing places to visit this incredible city that's largely been reconstructed sitting within this uh, stupendous scenery and great birding to boot. So a couple of the, the great birds of, of the Andes. Um, this is the Andean cock of the rock. And this, I took these photographs at a lek in, in Colombia. So they're also a whole lot of males come together and, and perform for females, similar to the rough. And these birds were completely oblivious to us. I actually had to take all the converter, the converter off my camera and back up as much as possible to actually take these photos. In the same family, the Katinga family, um, you get a whole suite of, of absolutely amazing birds. Um, another one is the uh, orange-breasted fruit eater. And um, toucans, um, quite a few species occur in the Andes. This is the plate-billed mountain toucan, one of the better looking ones, an absolutely stunning bird. Also one of the smaller toucans. Another bird that was uh, happily feeding and completely ignoring us. Um, this is the golden-eyed flower piercer in Ecuador. One of the most exciting birds that I've seen, and it also one of the hardest that I ever worked for, was the long-whiskered owlet. This occurs in, in cloud forest at about 2,000 meters or 6,500 feet. Um, so fairly, fairly low down as the Andes goes and very... Um, uh, wet and stunted cloud forest with dense undergrowth and a lot of epiphytes. And it's actually the small, second smallest owl in the world after the elf owl. So it's only five inches or 13 centimeters in size, weighs 47 grams or 1.6 ounces. And it has quite an interesting history. It was uh, actually caught in a mist net in 1976 during a ornithological expedition to this area, a very remote area of northern Peru. And they actually thought it was caught low down in the net and they thought, well, possibly this bird is even uh, terrestrial walking on the ground. It was named Long Whiskered Islet for these long whiskers and as you can see on his face. And it was only as observed again in 2007. So, so 30 years after it was first discovered. And it took birders a long time to figure out, you know, the call and how to see them. Now there's a lodge in, in the area where it occurs called Islet Lodge. And they take you down this long muddy trail and uh, they only uh, allow you to try it every second night so as to, to not disturb the bird too much and eventually we got the bird and the guide said okay you're allowed one photograph so this was my one and only photograph of this bird and I was very lucky that I was able to nail this this tiny little owl and a very exciting uh, moment it was. Um, Quetzals or tr and is part of the, are part of the trogan family um, and South America is extremely rich in trogans. This is an interesting individual, this one actually. This is in, in Colombia, outside Cali. And this is a hybrid of golden-headed and crested Quetzal. So it shows uh, features of, of both species. Um, another very sought after South American bird is the toucan barbet. So the, the toucan barbets are actually a family with two species, one in South America and the other is called prong-billed barbet in, in Costa Rica. And they're very large barbets midway between uh, toucans and uh, New World barbets. Um, and here's a prime example of a New World barbet, which is actually in a different family to the Asian and to the African barbets. And this is the red-headed barbet. So many people in South Africa ask me, why is the black collared barbet not called a red headed barbet? Because it's most obvious feature is the red head. And this is the reason why um, black collared barbet is not called red headed barbet because this uh, South and Central American species really does have a magnificent red head. But of course, hummingbirds are, are one of the most prolific families in, in South America and Central, well, in the Americas. 
And one of my favorite uh, bird families to, to watch and uh, photograph. Um, as also one, one of the families with the most species is 349 species of hummingbirds, actually the second highest of any bird family with just the tyrant flycatchers having more. And this is the long-billed starthroat. Um, and capturing hummingbirds in flight is, is one of my passions. And uh, what makes it easier is hummingbird feeders. Um, here's a, a video of, of a hummingbird feeding station uh, just outside Bogota. So these birds are known as hummingbirds because of the humming sound created by their beating wings, which sometimes sounds like uh, bees or, or other insects. And they are the most uh, magnificent flyers of any birds in the world. They're the only birds that can fly backwards and even fly upside down. Normal flight is up to 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour. And in a chase, um, it's actually been recorded in Green Violet Year, they go up to 150 kilometers or 90 miles an hour with their, their wing beats going up to 100 beats per second. Um, and there's a massive diversity from tiny, tiny ones all the way through to, to sort of fairly large ones. And here's a small selection of, of my favorite hummingbird photos that I've taken. This is the ruby topaz. Um, it was actually photographed at that feeding station where the video was taken just outside uh, Bogota in Colombia. And this is the chestnut-breasted coronet. coronet. Um, and each time a chestnut-breasted coronet lands, it flicks out its wings and it took me ages to finally capture this uh, moment perfectly. Another coronet is, is, is one of the most beautiful and colorful hummingbirds is the velvet purple coronet. And this is from Peru. This is the rainbow star frontlet. And you can see the stunning rainbow uh, plumage um, or feathers on its crown. Here we have a sylph, violet-tailed sylph. And this is one of the rarest hummingbirds. This is called the Tilima Blossom Crown, which is endemic to the Tilima Mountains in Colombia. And on my most recent Colombia trip, we went out to these mountains and hiked up to a lodge which doesn't have road access. And it's about the only stakeout for this Tilima Blossom Crown. You just got to sit around these flowers. And eventually one appears and I was able to, to take these photos. Um, you can see it's called a Blossom Crown from that beautiful, uh, orangey crown that it has. And here we have a green fronted brilliant. And you can see actually in, in this photograph, um, the, the nectar, uh, or sorry, the pollen from the flower that it's drinking on actually being deposited onto the forehead of the bird. And this is why these, these flowers actually provide the nectar so that hummingbirds and, and sometimes bees, etc., actually uh, distribute their pollen and um, for, for, for their, their breeding, basically. Um, but hummingbirds also uh, consume dozens of, of small invertebrates, um, and, and they drink about 160% of their own body weight in nectar every day. So they need to, to feed on uh, 1,000 to 2,000 flowers a day. Really, really amazing. Um, this is the festive coquette, one of the smallest of the hummingbirds. In fact, the, the smallest living bird species is the bee hummingbird of Cuba, which is uh, five centimeters or, or less than, than two inches in length and weighs 1.6 grams. Just absolutely tiny little creature. Another very small hummingbird, although its tail is, is quite long, is the wire crested thorn tail. Um, this I photographed in Ecuador. And this is the back and the front of the male. And you can actually see those, um, the tail, which gives it the, the name thorn tail. It really looks like these spiky thorns on his tail. And here we have one of the rarest hummingbirds. Um, this is the green bearded helmet crest, which is endemic to a tiny area of, of Colombia and high elevation. I mentioned earlier the Espelitia flowers, and, and they specialize on these tall flowers uh, or tall sunflower um, plants that uh, occur here in, in, in the Paramo. And uh, took me quite a few trips up to the high Paramo and freezing cold conditions 
before I finally managed to, to get this uh, photograph of this incredible tiny hummingbird, the green bearded helmet crest. The booted racket tail is another one of my favorites, also a tiny hummingbird, but it has these big puffy legs and in display they fly around with their, their legs all puffed out and, and showing off and, and, and they can actually lift this, the, the, the rackets on their tail. Um, really fascinating birds. And here's one of the bigger hummingbirds. This is a violet saber wing. Um, and yeah, just seems the, the diversity of hummingbirds doesn't end. Uh, here's another stunner. This is the golden-tailed sapphire. And here we have the bronze-tailed plumeleteer. And this is a Central American species in the mountains of Central America. This is the, the, the snowcap, also a tiny, tiny hummingbird and one of my favorites, the little snowcap. Another stump stunner, um, actually quite a common one. This is the crown wood nymph. And another very common one is the sparkling violet ear. And when they get uh, aggressive or territorial, they're actually able to flip out these um, uh, feathers that form this, this violet ear that this group of hummingbirds are named after. One of the most remarkable of them all, of course, is the sword-billed hummingbird. This has a 12 centimeter or 4.7 inch bill, which has um, co-evolved with the flowers with which they predominantly feed on, which are Deuteria and Brugmania. So in many cases, uh, um, flowers and the hummingbirds have evolved together. And these are known as ornithophilus flowers. And here's the uh, sword-billed hummingbird in flight. So what's interesting about the sword-billed hummingbird is, is they actually have to sit at a particular angle, the bill at a particular angle for them to, to manage holding it. And they also have very long claws because they obviously can't preen with their bills. So their claws are able to reach the entire body. Another feature of uh, birding in the, in the Andes um, are these uh, ant pitter feeders. Uh, this is an example of, of a birding group sitting at one of the ant pitter feeders in Colombia. So ant pitters are a group of generally extremely secretive forest birds. And when I first went to South America in 2000, a lot of these ant pitters were absolutely mythical species. I saw a few, I heard quite a few more that I didn't see and others I didn't even come near to finding in my five months in, in South America. And now, nowadays, there's ant pitter feeders across much of the Andes. And uh, here, they've basically habituated these ant pitters. So you get these stunning creatures like this chestnut-crowned ant pitter coming out and virtually being hand-fed on earthworms by, by the feeder of these stations. Um, this is a species yellow-bellied ant pitter, which, again, is one I only heard back in 2000. And when I went back to Ecuador last year, it was one of the easiest birds to see at a feeding station. They really are like little eggs on legs with these long legs and, and round bodies and almost no tail. This is the bicolored ant pitter at, at another feeding station in Colombia. And uh, this is the tawny ant pitter, which is one of the higher elevation species in full song. On my most recent Colombia trip, uh, we, we had the very fortunate experience of finding this ant pitter. And this is an as yet unnamed ant pitter that was only recently discovered in the mountains just uh, outside of Cali in southwestern uh, Colombia. Uh, it was discovered by a university uh, research group in, in this municipal reserve. And as far as I'm aware, we're the first uh, Westerners to have been allowed with very special permission to go and see this bird. Um, it, it meant leaving very early in the morning, way before dawn and, and hiking up in the dark about two hours into the forest uh, with um, the, a local guard and, and researcher um, until they took us to an area where, where there was a pair and several hours of, of just quietly waiting in, in the territory and, until we finally managed to, to see and photograph this female of this uh, very rare and as yet undescribed uh, ant pitter. So this was our, our group in, in absolute celebration after, after seeing this, this fantastic bird. And circling back to Africa, one of the favorite places that, that I, I go to very regularly is a game reserve in Zululand where I have a lodge called Zebra Hills. This is the scenery. 
And um, this is uh, myself with one of our rangers. His name is Wonderboy Gumbi, and he's just an absolutely fantastic birder and um, great all-round guide and person. And um, you know, just in, in quite a small area, we've now recorded 417 bird species. Uh, and these are some of, of my favorite photos from the area. This is the secretary bird, which is another unique bird, uh, monotypic bird family, the only one in the family and uh, with no close relatives. And they feed a lot on snakes and, and uh, other reptiles. This is the black-shouldered kite, quite a common raptor. Um, they feed, uh, catch mostly rodents, as you can see here. This one's just caught a mouse and uh, one of my favorite photographs. Here we have a black stork, which generally is known kind of as a black and white bird, but when you actually get a, a really good view of it, you get all this amazing glossy plumage uh, appearing on it. Another common bird on this reserve is, is the black-bellied bustard, um, and, and they have a, a crazy display where they basically suck in air and pull their heads back, and then after a few seconds, they suddenly pop it out with a blop like call, almost like a champagne cork popping. And another actually fairly common bird, um, but just wonderful when, when you get a good photo of it and able to study its, its beautiful plumage. This is the Diederik cuckoo. Um, Diederik is an onomatopoeic name after its call. Little bee eaters, um, very common uh, in Zululand and, and large parts of South Africa and, and beautiful birds with this delicate blue eye, eye liner. And European bee eaters. Um, this is a migrant from southern and central Europe that occur in, in huge numbers uh, in our in Zululand and other parts of South Africa in the summer. We also have uh, nine species of owls on this game reserve, um, and there's nothing better than photographing owls. Uh, and they're quite different between day and night. So here we have an African scops owl in both environments um, during the day, just kind of winking at us. One of the common birds, but extremely hard to see and, and always a joy when you get a good view of it, is the gorgeous bushrike. And you can see why it's called gorgeous bushrike. They, they have this incredible plumage, very vocal, but tough, tough to see. This is the violet-backed starling. Again, a bird that can appear black and white in, in certain lights, but other times just shows off this incredible violet-colored Plumage. It used to be called the plum colored starling, which is a name I actually much prefer. And when certain plants like aloes flower, it attracts a lot of sunbirds. This is a scarlet chested sunbird, just provides um, wonderful opportunities for photography with, with a background like this. And here we have the gray heron with a small fish. So just north of our game reserve is, is another reserve called Simanga, where they put up these incredible bird hides with, with one-way glass, and you're able to photograph it on little species such as this, um, this heron. And this is another photograph taken at the same hide. These are great to painted snipes. So the female here is actually the colorful one on the right. And uh, painted snipes, similar to a few other groups of birds, such as button quails and, and phalaropes um, and jacanas, actually display a, um, a breeding system called polyandry. So this is where the female actually holds a territory comprising several males that she aggressively defends against other females. And she'll mate with all of her males in her territory and then lay her eggs in, uh, in the territory of each of the males. And that's the end of her uh, rearing responsibility. She goes off and carries on defending the territory and does what she does. And the males actually sit on the eggs and, and raise the young. So the female, as I mentioned, is the boldly patterned colorful bird that actually gives this group, um, the painter snipe, their name. Um, and the males are, are much duller. And here's a beautiful reflective uh, photograph of, of the female painted snipe. And here's another lovely reflective photograph of, of Egyptian gooses. Um, very special to be able to get photos like this. And three banded plover. They actually have, uh, you actually walk through a tunnel to get to this hide. Uh, and they've actually built a small lake within a lake and all these birds 
come right up to you. It's, it's a magnificent experience. They also have small little hides um, around where you get a lot of seed eaters coming down to drink, such as this red bull fire finch. Um, two years ago, uh, we had a, a wonderful vagrant pitch up on our game reserve. This was the 19th Southern African record of golden pipit. This is actually an East African species that sometimes wanders down into Southern Africa. And this particular individual hung around for nearly three months. And I remember when I took this photo out, I took a group of friends to go look at the bird. It was found right inside a, another lodge on the game reserve. And we pulled into the parking lot and this bird just immediately just flew and landed right next to us. Um, we all had this amazing views. I took these photographs. We watched it for about five or six minutes and then it flew off and disappeared. And we didn't even get out of the vehicle. I'm just amazed to get this incredibly rare bird right in front of us. They even have uh, buttercup yellow underwings, uh, which make them quite remarkable. And uh, this photo actually made it onto the um, African bird life um, front cover, the highlight of a golden summer. But even in your gardens or backyards, um, photography can be extremely rewarding. Um, this is a, a Cape Robin chat, which is a common bird in, in my backyard. Um, another common bird, we've planted aloes and we get um, white-bellied sunbirds coming to, to drink the nectar from, from these aloes. We've also got proteas and we get malachite sunbirds coming down. So wherever you are in the world, you can photograph birds even in your backyards. And uh, that is the end, the, the end of, of the rock jumper. So thank you very much for, for listening to my story and uh, following me around the world um, and uh, looking at some of my favorite bird photos and sharing some of my uh, wonderful, happy moments out in the field. Uh, thank you. Wow. <laughs> Adam, thank that you. That was amazing, for, Adam. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. thank you for taking us around the world. Um, before we go into Q&A with Adam and Lev, uh, a reminder that next week we head off to the world's fourth largest island, Madagascar. The island alone has four endemic bird families and a further two that are shared with only the Camores, um, Camoros, sorry, while also boasting over a hundred species of different lemurs. The marvels of Madagascar extend uh, well beyond its avian gems and the island also plays host to an exceptional diversity of creatures. Join Rock Jumpers tour leader Greg de Klerk uh, for an impactful overview highlighting the island's incredible diversity. Um, these webinars in the series are being offered for free of charge, uh, but should you, however, wish to donate towards our tour leaders, our GoFundMe donation link will be soon found in your chat box. Um, time for some Q&A. So if you have any questions, just send it in Q&A and the floor is yours. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for that, Adam. That was uh, amazing. I almost had to, you know, go and get a lobster bib to prevent myself from drooling all over my laptop <laughs> after seeing those photos. But uh, yeah, lots of amazing comments coming in. Amazing photography. Uh, oh, my goodness. This has been lovely. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Adam, for sharing your fantastic photography. So yeah, it seems like uh, it was a huge hit. Appreciate the, the great comments. Yeah, yeah. And they are oh, just still rolling in. And the most, uh, the most asked question that I have here in the Q&A box is, what is the one family that you have not yet seen? Uh, the one family I haven't yet seen is the Plains Wanderer, ah. which is a, a strange little bird that occurs um, mostly in the outback of Australia. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of like a button quail um, and, and, or, or a quail sort of like bird. Um, that is usually seen at night. Um, there, there's one particular area of, of Australia which is quite good for finding it, but it's throughout its range, it's, it's a pretty rare and, and difficult to find bird. And uh, it's one I haven't actually had a chance to go and search for yet. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another one that's at the top of my list. Yeah, that's a, a great, a great bird. Uh, yeah, lots of uh, more and more positive comments coming in from all over the world, from El Salvador, from lots of places in the States. Great presentation. Um, 
A question here from Robert. Where was the tall tower in Amazonia? This was at Napo Wildlife Center um, in, in Ecuador. Um, which is a fantastic community run facility, very professionally run. They haven't been hunting in the area for, for many, many years. So you get a lot of species that in surrounding reserves are, are still quite difficult to find. Um, and I can't more highly recommend Napa Wildlife Center. They ha actually have several towers, but that particular morning we just had a, a, a fantastic session on, on that tower. Yeah, towers in Amazonia are always a, a good bet, aren't they? Um, can you talk a bit more about tours to Papua New Guinea and seeing the birds of paradise? How difficult is it to get to see them? Um, so, yeah, actually, they, the birds of paradise are some of the commonest birds in Papua New Guinea. So they're not actually that difficult to see. Um, the, the trip itself can be difficult. We, we do have several trips to New Guinea. So, so we have a sort of a highlights version, which is an easier version of the trip. And then we have more comprehensive and difficult trips. But um, the, the birds of paradise occur at fairly high densities. And we obviously have quite a few uh, display lakes actually staked out. Um, where, and, and the local people actually protect them. Um, they get revenue from having these display lakes on, on their properties. We pay them uh, to bring groups on and uh, they very carefully look after these birds. And um, on, on most, you know, on, on all of our New Guinea trips, you'll, you'll see 20 or more different birds of paradise species in Papua New Guinea. West Papua also has even more species of, of birds of paradise, as well as our remote uh, Papuan cruise, where you can see the incredible Wilson's uh, bird of paradise um, on Batanta Island. Um, but yeah, they, it is one of the most inc incredible experiences of the world, seeing these birds of paradise. And fortunately, it's not too difficult. Very cool. Another question here from Sean, very good question. How safe is Colombia as a birding destination? So Colombia for many years had a, a reputation of being extremely dangerous and it was extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, but nowadays it's for the most part an extremely safe destination. There, there's still tiny pockets of Colombia that you don't go to, but these are, are very remote. Um, but there's some very well beaten birding circuits and uh, the, the birding in Colombia is, is just phenomenal. Uh, it's definitely right up there in my top three uh, favorite birding destinations in the world. Um, and it's as safe as, as almost anywhere else in the world. Yeah, I, I will whole, wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah, I love Colombia and it's great birding. Um, there's a, a good question here. Where is the best spot to see breeding rough? So uh, Finland is a particularly good place to see breeding ruff. It's where I took those photographs. Um, they have some hides that you can sit in and, and uh, watch them. Um, uh, that's the only place I've actually personally seen them. I know there's, there's certain parts of Belarus where you can see them, but um, across much of, of Northern Europe, um, they do breed in, in, in the sort of tundra zone. Um, but yeah, fin Finland is, is where I've had my experiences and it was very easy to find them and watch them. All right. Jillian has a, another one here. We all have nemesis birds. What is yours? Also, having seen so many birds, can you possibly narrow down your favorite? Which was a question that a few people asked. Um, yeah, so my, my favorite bird uh, is the blue crane, which I mentioned earlier. It's a bird, one of the first birds I saw um, I lived on, on, on a farm just outside Peter Marisburg and we had a breeding pair and they used to come over in the evening with this loud rattling call, very similar to, to a sandhill if you, if you know that call. And they're just such elegant, beautiful birds and it always has been my, my favorite bird. Um, but but I, I do love um, hummingbirds as I mentioned, uh, pitters and ant pitters are, are another favorite group, owls and raptors. Nemesis birds, I had a nemesis mammal for many years, uh, the art fark, which just eluded me and eluded me and eluded me until I finally got it this year. Um, but, but there are several birds that I, I should have seen by now um, that I just haven't bumped into, uh, one of which is the evening grosbeak. I'd love to see that bird and I've just always been unlucky with that one. Um, 
So yeah, probably if you had to choose one nemesis, it would be Evening Grows Beak. Oh, you should come over here, Adam. We've got a, we had a really good year for them. Yeah, lots, lots coming down. So COVID. Um, John says, incredibly well done photographs. Uh, how long have you been uh, at photography? I've been photographing for probably about 10 years. So I started off digiscoping, which was for me a very disappointing uh, endeavor. Uh, I, I got very few decent photographs and then I, I started videoing and I videoed birds for two or three years. Um, but yeah, photography gives you instant satisfaction. And as soon as I got a, a decent SLR camera, I just really took to photography and, and have loved it ever since. Um, but I'm more of a, a birder who photographs than, than a photographer who, who happens to photograph birds. So. I don't spend a lot of time sort of staking out birds and sitting and, and trying to photo, get that perfect photograph. Almost all these photographs are taken just as I'm birding and in the field and spending a lot of time. I'm lucky enough to get close or, or to get some really cool behavior and then I'll always have my camera strapped to me and uh, grab a few photos. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say at least 10 years I've been photographing now, maybe even 12. Right on. Uh, several people have asked, what are your other top two favorite destinations for birding? Uh, Uganda is, is one of my favorite countries. It's right in the heart of Africa. In fact, it, it's, it's known as the Pearl of Africa. And uh, it, it's a small country with over a thousand species. And it has habitats that cover almost everything that you get in Africa. So southern savannas, you get lowland rainforests, you get the northern savannas, huge papyrus swamps, um, the, the Albertine Rift with high elevation mountains, huge lakes. So it's, it's just a great country and plus it has mountain gorillas and, and lions and all sorts of cool animals as well as the birds. Um, and then, you know, anywhere along the Andes um, is, is just fabulous. So Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, the, those are, unrivaled birding destinations in the world and and then of course new guinea um uh, you know seeing those birds of paradise is is just spectacular absolutely absolutely totally agree with those cheryl asks uh, about wax wings uh no other birds have the waxy tips do they do you know what the wax is for and she's enjoyed watching cedar wax wings uh, in canada um, so, so they're not actually waxy tips. They just look like sealing wax. Um, so it reminded people because it's a, a little splodge, it kind of reminded people of sealing wax and, and hence the name. But as far as I'm aware, it's, it's, and, and it's may, maybe, you know, otherwise I live, I just thought it was called wax ring because of the appearance rather than, than the actual substance. Yeah, I think uh, that's true. The substance is actually, it's a carotenoid pigment. It's called astaxanthin, I think, or uh, it's one of these carotenoid pigments and it's an aging thing as the bird uh, gets older it gets more waxy tips uh so their purpose i don't think is is known or at least there hasn't been anything published but uh you can age birds relatively reliably i think by uh how many waxy tips they have and japanese waxwing doesn't have those tips so it's just the cedar and the and the bohemian the european or american one that has yeah so yeah cool all right. Uh, Alan asks, are there any tours which could safely deliver 400 new species to the average birder other than Ecuador and Kenya? Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, we, we have a lot of tours that, that uh, get numbers like four or 500 bird species. Um, in fact, we, we have a tour, um, our Columbia mega tour that aims for a thousand species and often does get over a thousand species, although that also includes herds. So you wouldn't get a thousand new bird species, but uh, you'd get close to it uh, if you haven't birded in the Americas. Um, but, but countries with, with high bird counts um, on tours, South Africa, um, Kenya, as, as was mentioned, um, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Brazil. And in fact, most of, of South and Central America will, will pr produce numbers like that. And then certain countries in Asia, depending on, on the tour itself, you know, if you do a a reasonably comprehensive trip of India or, or Malaysia um, and Indonesia, you can certainly get to, to numbers like that, as well as Australia. 
Very cool. And Dale asks, what country holds the most unseen lifers for you? Um, probably Australia. I actually haven't spent a lot of time in Australia. So there's a, a lot of birds there for me to find. So I'm looking forward to, to some, some solid birding in, in, in Australia. Probably second to that is, is Brazil. There's still quite vast areas of Brazil I haven't been to. I've, I've covered Western South America quite extensively, but uh, certainly much of Brazil I need to get to. And, and it's staggeringly rich in bird species. Oh, yeah. A nice question here. If you have only one more trip to Africa, which country could you choose for number of species if you've already been to South Africa and Zimbabwe? Um, so, you know, I think South Africa, if, if, if you're doing a, a, a few birding tours, um, you should definitely do East Africa. So choose you know, Ethiopia, Tanzania or Kenya or a combination of Kenya and Tanzania, which is one of our most popular tours. One of the Southern African countries, South Africa being the best, but Namibia is also fantastic. One West African country, um, and I'd probably recommend Ghana as, as a great option for West Africa. It's, it's the easiest um, West African country. And then one North African country. So I would recommend Morocco as the best North African country. So, you know, North Africa doesn't get anywhere near as many species as as uh, sub-Saharan Africa, but it's well worth visiting. So if, if you've only been to Southern Africa, I, I would make a choice between Western or Eastern. Um, Eastern also has the, the, the great um, mammal biodiversity. So our, our combination of Kenya Tanzania tour, which is uh, 18 days visiting the most famous game parks in Kenya and, Kenya and Tanzania is a fantastic tour. But if you want something that's more different to, to, to Southern Africa, then I'd recommend Ghana um, for the rainforests and Sahelian savannas. All right. And Robin asks, what is your mammal life list? I never actually added it up. Um, and it's something I ought to do. I actually, to be honest, I haven't added up my bird life list accurately either. I have all my notes and everything ticked in every field guard. And I, I have a a good estimate of how many birds I've seen, over 8,000, but I don't know the exact number. Um, but mammals, I, um, I, I can't even guess. Uh, I, I have, again, I have all the notes and all my tour uh, trip lists and checklists that I've been keeping over the years. And uh, one day when maybe my children are grown up and uh, take up less of my time, I'll have the joy of sitting through and, and working out exactly what my mammal life list is. But I, I imagine, I'm sure it must be over 500. Wow. <laughs> the top so are, are over 1,000 on, on mammals. All right. Lance asks, are feathers sought for Sing Sing still an issue in Papua New Guinea? Um, so, uh, so the question is really, uh, the Sing Sings are the traditional dance ceremonies that... Uh, some of the tribes do in New Guinea. And in these, they adorn themselves in the feathers, uh, not only the feathers, but also sort of the beaks of, of hornbills and, and all sorts of things. But they, they use a lot of uh, birds of paradise and are inspired by the birds of paradise courtship dances and, and uh, often mimic those. They have sort of branches and around them and uh, you know, with lots of leaves. And it's, it's, it's a fantastic thing to watch these tribes doing these uh, dances in New Guinea. Um, but these birds of paradise feathers uh, are handed down from generation to generation. Um, so generally they don't need lots of new birds of paradise feathers. But as I also mentioned, the birds of paradise, most species are actually quite common and occur at pretty high densities uh, in these forests of New Guinea. Um, not many of the birds of paradise are actually endangered or threatened. Um, so it's, it's not of major concern if, if small numbers are still taken, um, obviously illegally, um, for their plumes for these Sing Sing festivals. All right. There's one, uh, another good question here. Diana says, amazing photography. Uh, what camera setup do you use? So I have a Canon 7D Mark II. And for most of my photographs, um, I've used a 500 mil lens with a 1.4 converter. Um, although recently I've taken off the converter um, due to a friend of mine, Richard Flack's advice. 
and I'm shooting just with, with the 500 mil lens. Um, yeah. Nice. All right. Nancy just asked, uh, fresh off the press, what spotting scope do you use? So I've, I've used Zeiss equipment for many, many years. Um, the Zeiss Hapia is an absolutely incredible telescope. Um, and uh, also the Zeiss Gavia is a slightly older model, also a great telescope. All right. And we've got a question from Juan. What is your favorite family of birds? Um, I think I'd have to go with cranes. I, I just absolutely adore cranes. They, they are so regal and elegant. Um, and, uh, you know, something like the crown crane is just a mind-blowing bird. Heartily agreed. All right. Well, we're running low on the questions, uh, on the questions here. Do we have some time uh, for a couple more questions there, Nikki? Yes, yeah, so uh, time's running out, but I see there is two that uh, went through the chat now. And um, the, the one is, um, what is the name of the reserve in South Africa where many of your photos were taken, Adam? So that's the Manyoni Private Game Reserve in Zululand. And uh, Zebra Hills Lodge is, is the lodge that I'm involved in. Oh, brilliant. And then Mary Keith is just asking here, whose rear end is your final photo of? That, of course, is the rock jumper. <laughs> brilliant. Uh, I think that's it for, for time. Thank you so much, Adam. That really was a great presentation. Just lots of warm wishes coming through. Thank you, Lev, for the Q&A. And from all of us from the Rock Dumper team, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week and enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a good week. <laughs>